Good morning. Uh, today and on Wednesday, we'll look at uh, Kripke's reading of Wittgenstein in these central passages in the investigations. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, today I'll just set out what I take Kripke's basic picture is of what's going on here. Um, and start out by looking at what he calls the sceptical paradox. So suppose you consider your own present use of the word plus. 3 plus 4 is 7 and all that. Um, uh, the notion you first learned all those many years ago. Uh, so I guess we have all done a certain number of actual additions in the past, but you, most of us, well, for any of us, there will be some large number such that we haven't done any additions beyond that number, if you see what I mean. Um, you might have added a million and a million and got two million, but there's going to be some number that you never got up to, because some numbers are very, very large, right? Uh, so Kripke supposes that it's 57, that you've never added beyond 57, but... Um, uh, I know that we're all hyper-sophisticated, and many of you will probably have added beyond 57 at some point, but um, if, you, if, you, if you think 57 is not the right number for you, then just pencil in 10 Googles or whatever your favorite large number, whatever you think the number might be that you never got beyond. So here are two hypotheses as to what you meant by plus when you've used it in the past. One is you meant addition. The other is, when you were using plus in the past, what you meant was quas. And here's what quas means. x quas y is the same as x plus y if x and y are both less than 57. Follow me very closely. Um, and if x, either x or y is identical to or greater than 57, then x plus y is 5. Okay, so let, let, let's just do a couple of exercises. Um, what's 5 plus 3? 8. What's 5 plus 3? Very good. What's um, uh, 56 plus 1? What's 56 plus 1? Very good. What's 57 plus 1? Very, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, right. So, here are two hypotheses as to what you meant in the past when you were using plus. Um, that you meant addition or that you meant quas. And the trouble is to see how we're going to decide between them. I suppose, for example, that in the past you always meant... Um, plus, suppose just, we just take for granted that you always meant plus, but I assigned the meaning quas to the plus sign. Is there going to be any difference between us? Well, let's break it down. Well, would there be any difference in the answers that you and I had given to any particular calculations? There would? Oh, you mean if you had never added that? Above 57. Right, remember that we're taking 57 to be a very large number. Right, I mean, and if you don't like 57 for that purpose, take uh, 10 to the 57. Yeah. Okay. So would there be any difference in the answers we'd given to any particular calculations? Yeah. No, because for everything below 57, and we only added up below 57, and uh, for everything up to 57, x plus y and x cos y give the same answer. So there'd be no difference there. So... There's no difference in what answers we've given to any particular sums. You mean plus, I mean quas, but when we use the cross sign, um, we'd both have given the same answers to, um, to any particular calculation. So what, where would the difference between us be if you meant plus and I meant quas? Because after all, I might say, well... Uh, by the cross sign, I mean addition. You say, oh, that's funny. By the cross sign, I meant addition too. We use the same word, addition. Right? 
So what is going through our mind when they do all these calculations is just the same. You look at 56 plus 1 FA57, I look at 56 plus 1 and I say 57. And what is going through our mind is just the same when we do those calculations. So everything that went through our minds in the past when we were using the cross sign was just the same. So we agreed in the answers we gave to every particular calculation and what was running through our minds as we did it was the same. And Kripke says, well, was there any past fact about me that mandates what I should, that you meant, about what you meant by plus, that mandates what you should do now? Well, there's no telling the difference between you and me, whether you meant plus or whether you meant quas. Like, what, what is the difference? There isn't any difference between you and me. You meant one thing and I meant the other. So if you ask, was there anything in your past life that commits you to saying um, uh, 59, when you're asked what 57 plus 2 is, rather than 5, the answer is no. Because I meant plus all the time, and it's fine for me to say 5. But you only had it going through your head or in the answers you gave, just the same thing I did. So there wasn't any past fact about you that was committing you, that was mandating you to give one answer rather than another. No. So there's nothing that makes it the case that you meant plus rather than quas, there isn't any difference between us. And similarly, if that's what's true about the past, the same is true right now. If you ask about what is running through your head right now, there's nothing about you right now that makes it so that you currently mean addition rather, rather than quadition by the plus sign. But this is pretty far reaching this because you could construct this kind of example for any sign, whatever. Here's Kripke. Wittgenstein thinks that any construal that looks for something in my present mental state, state to differentiate between my meaning addition or quadition, or that will show that in the future I should say 125 when asked about 68 plus 57, is there anything in my present mental state that will differentiate addition or quadition, meaning addition or quadition, or implying that I've got to say 125 rather than 5? That's a misconstrual. That's attributing to the ordinary person a notion of meaning that's refuted by these skeptical arguments. By the skeptical argument, he means the kind of thing we've just been working through to already today and last week, where you say, well, what could there be in the actual calculations you made, in your actual behavior, or in what was running through your mind, could there be anything there that would differentiate, meaning addition or quadition, um, or dictating that the right answer is 125? And I'm saying there's nothing there. But that is a really radical conclusion. It, it seems very, the argument is very, very simple and very, very forceful, but it implies that there's nothing in your mind right now that constitutes you meaning one thing rather than another by the sign. I just set it up for addition and quadition, but obviously you could do this again and again for endlessly many different possible meanings for the sign. Um, uh, consider the notion of zaddition, which you get for 58, when you substitute 58 for 57, or vadition when you substitute 60 for 57. You see what I mean? There is endlessly many alternative possibilities here. So there's nothing in your mental state that constitutes you meaning one thing rather than another by the sign. But if that's right, then there's no such thing as anyone presently assigning any particular meaning to the cross. But the argument's obviously quite general. You could do this for any sign at all. If you take a notion like chair, where um, uh, you mean by chair just what we regularly, by the word chair, you just mean a regular chair. When I say chair, I mean a word that applies to anything if it's a chair that's been observed before the year 2013. 
but um, uh, come 2013, it will apply only to zebras. Is there anything in our minds that will differentiate between what you mean by chair and what I mean by chair? Nothing in uh, which objects we've applied the word chair to in the past, and nothing in um, what was running through our minds when we were using the term in the past. So you could do this for any term, whatever. So there's no such thing as anyone presently assigning any particular meaning to the plus sign, or indeed to any other sign, given the great generality of the argument. The argument is so simple. So here's Kripke. Wittgenstein's main problem is that it appears that he has shown all language and all concept formation to be impossible, indeed unintelligible. I mean, it's not that there's something very difficult here that we wish we could do. It's that when you think through what it is that, would be, that success would be, you see you can't make any sense of it. There's no such thing as being successful. There's no such thing as meaning. Right. And so we might. And so it seems just like that. Anything prior to anything below fifty-seven is just ambiguous. But that doesn't mean that we mean that there is no practical matter about it. Yeah. Well, w w once you once you and I actually do use plus uh, the plus sign um, for number in connection with numbers that are above fifty-seven, then you'll go one way and I'll go another. Yeah. Um, but the question is, was there anything in what was in our minds before we got above the 57 that dictated our going one way rather than another? The previous examples on which we agreed don't dictate our going one way rather than another. And for any general formula, like, well, by the plus I mean addition, you and I can both agree on that. Right, that's like that thing about the, plus, the x plus 1 that just is dragged around after the particular examples. If you were asked what you meant by addition, you'd say, well, 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 2 is 2, and so on. You'd give lots of examples. If you asked me what I meant by addition, I'd say 0 plus 1 is 1, and I'd give the same examples as you, below 57. Yeah. So then the question is, before we get up to these high numbers above 57, was there anything in what was happening then? that dictated that you should go one way and I should go the other. And that's the point. If the answer to that is no, then it seems like we have a completely free choice when we get to 57, you and I. Um, there was nothing that dictated that you meant one thing rather than the other. But that's, that's already to give you the conclusion. Carry on. You, you could still have in mind plus r addition rather than quadition. So if you take the set of all numbers, uh -huh. you that's a lot, yes. Numbers, uh, once, uh, you uh, think, um, numbers prior or below and above 57, you're going to use plus as opposed to quads. Right. And so even though for numbers below 57, it may not make a difference, um, for all the numbers that you're worried about, uh, you're going to Uh, the, uh, what, what, your task is to show that there's something different going on in your mind and in my mind even before we start adding the high numbers, right? Right. Okay, so what was the difference? The difference was that um, we're, in my mind, I'm taking um, the numbers below 57 as a part of a larger set. 
Right. And so even though in the cases below 57, it doesn't make a material difference, um, I still have, the, I guess, in the background somewhere that I'm using plus instead of plus. In my mind. Well, the, the thing is, um, for me to be using quas, right, I need not be using an explicit definition like that. When you say addition, I mean, it is possible to define addition, yeah? Uh, but usually when a regular person is using addition, they're not using some fancy set theoretical addition, uh, definition of what addition is, yeah? Addition is just a primitive. So for me, quas is just a primitive. It's not defined in terms of anything. Um, I mean, when we find out what's going on, I might say, oh, I, when you're using the plus sign, you're using some really, really weird notion. You mean, um, we, what you mean is x plus y is x cross y, x cross y, if, uh, if they're less, uh, for x, y, less than 57. And you've got some really weird notion here. If x, y are greater than or equal to 57, um, uh, then you're going to say uh, this is um, x zadition y, right? Uh, where zadition is um, a, a, a zadition is x cos y is, is a zadition is um, zero if x and y are less than 57 and x plus y if x and y are greater than or equal to 57. So I see you're using this really weird defined notion, right? How peculiar. Um, yeah, I was just thinking of the whole set of numbers and co-addition and addition for all of them. Yeah? You had this funny defined notion. We're both regarding them as primitive. But are, you, I mean, you regard addition as primitive. I regard co-addition as primitive. Yeah. Neither of us regards it as a defined notion, but each of us can regard the other as defining some weird counterintuitive defined notion. It's, it still seems weird because you can articulate that. I mean, you can give a rule. That's right. In most normal cases, you might think that it is simple just because most people don't give a definition for addition or addition or addition. Um, but it's still possible. I mean, it's That's right. It is possible to articulate these things, yeah, but you've got to rely on a primitive notion of addition. That for you is addition, if you see what I mean, and for me is quadition. You you take addition as primitive, I take quadition as primitive. Or what's possible in both cases is definition. But it, but definition always depends on how, what stock of primitives you have. Uh, yeah. Can I respond to that? Yes, sure. Um, yeah. Right. Um, but I think that's a mistake because there's a difference between defining the way the function works on all inputs yes. and then applying that function to specific inputs to give an output, right? So if I say um, x plus 3 and then I give you 2, you say 5, right? So in addition, we have different rules for adding fractions, right? We're thinking about finding the lowest common denominator, all this stuff. But when I'm adding 2 plus 3 is 5, I'm not thinking about what I do with fractions. No, that's true. So similarly, a quester isn't thinking about what they do with numbers greater than 57. Right. If I'm following you, the, 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 then the point is that uh, someone using quest might be just, um, how should I say, if, if, if you're asked, what's 23 plus 2? Most of us would just, as you might say, unthinkingly say 25. Right. It's not that you run through some backup operation here. And you're saying similarly for the quester when... Um, they say, what's uh, 23 cos 2? They don't do some calculation. They just say 25. They don't need to explicitly look and say, are they less than 57? They don't consult a definition. They don't do anything like that. They just unthinkingly say 25. Yeah, I think that's exactly the picture. That's right. Is it? Yeah. So I understand the difference between a function and applying the function to yeah. particular cases. Um, but all the same, you can have a function. So the point you made here is that you can have different notions of what's primitive. Yes, you can still right. articulate what's primitive. You can still have that in your mind, and you could test that against what somebody else articulates as primitive. 
So you say, um, I'm weird because I'm using plus, and <laughs> really the primitive thing is plus. Um, yeah. But I could still say to you that really the primitive thing is plus and not plus, and so we can have an argument about that. Right. Well, we could if, if we could get to that point. Um, but the thing is, when you say we can make that explicit or you can articulate it, what the primitive thing is, yeah? Um, well, the thing is, you, what do you say is the primitive thing? If you're, uh, uh, how can I put this, a regular guy? Uh, <laughs> you, 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 how, how would you uh, put what your primitive is? You say addition, right? Yeah. Um, well, the thing is, that's what I say. I say it's addition. And, what, and the, there isn't any definition to appeal to here. Because yeah, they're both taking you. Uh, you say, it's, you say well, when I say addition, I mean something primitive. And I say, sure, when I say addition, I mean something primitive. So it's not clear what articulate means here with a primitive. Or it doesn't mean give a definition. So there are people behind you wanting to yeah. come in and just this, I think. Uh, yeah, one, two. Sorry, can you do that later? I feel like she may have answered me. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Paul. There was one other person behind you wanted to do. Okay. Uh, can we show that like plus has inherent contradictions? Plus has inherent contradictions? Right. No, wait a minute. Oh, 50 plus 7 is identical to 57. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And you go, all right, well then, 50 plus 7 plus 1 is 58. And that, that works in both systems. And you go, okay. No, no, wait a minute. Uh, uh, Yeah, uh, you, you have to make up your mind. There are two different calculations you might mean by 50 plus 7 okay, plus 1. Uh, okay. It's 58, right? Yeah. But then you do 57 plus 1, uh -huh. and you get 5. Right? <laughs> and that's a contradiction. Is that right? I can't that's a con oh, what's a contradiction? Contradiction is P and not P, right? Okay. Do it. Get, get, get me to... <laughs> well, then you... Since you can only do two places, you just go backwards. You go, look, 50, if, uh, 50 plus 1 is equal to 51. So that's showing that you just added 1. 50 plus 1 is 51, right? So that's showing that you just added 1 to the second step. And then you go... Yeah. This thing is hopeless. <laughs> the, the best you can hope for is that I get confused. <laughs> but uh, so look, if you if you look at the def, if you go just a second, look, if you, if you go back to the definition of quas, right? This is perfectly well defined. There really isn't a contradiction in this. And if you just think of that as um, you you really might want to construct a function like that for, uh, in doing some mathematical problem, some simple arithmetical problem. Yeah, um, no reason why not. It, it, it just is well defined, um, and I think that 
I mean, I, 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 just, I, I don't want to force you to go on this too long, but I really don't think, I, I really don't see how you could be getting a contradiction there. It would be an absolute revolution if you did. I mean, for, if from a simple definition like that, that looks perfectly sensible, you could generate a, a, a contradiction. There's mo there, there is more to say about this, but I think it's not going to take... There's, mo there's more to say about how you might get into difficulty here, you, trying to use quas, but I don't think it's going to take the form of just generating something in the form P and not P. I don't see how that could happen. Okay. Well, one, two. Right, right. Quas can be defined in terms of our normal memory addition, but the opposite is not true. You can't fully define the function of addition for all numbers with just the notion of quas and the numbers themselves. I don't see why not. I mean, so long as you have a notion like z addition, well, x and y, x z x z y, x z y is zero. If x and y are less than 57, right? And if otherwise, x thus y is x plus y, right? So then ordinary so addition. You're defining in terms of two terms. That's right. So you're um, saying that, that, that that's right. But quotations thus together are, are more primitive than. Uh, addition, yeah. That's right. On the understanding of on the understanding of primitive on which addition is primitive, right. <laughs> right. then addition is more primitive. Sure, um, but the, the whole trouble is who gets to say what's primitive. Yeah. yeah, and it's kind of more basic than that. It's that once you acknowledge that whatever you do, some signs are primitive. What gives those primitive signs their meanings? And the thing is. What happens in a finite set of initial cases isn't enough to give those signs their meanings. And since they're not um, defined signs, there's no general formula you can appeal to as what gives them their meanings. So it really is a, it's a very simple problem, but it's very general. Um, one, two. Yeah. Right, yes. So it seems like the only rules you really need are, or at least possibly the only rules you really need are just the addition of the numbers 0 through 9, this rule of carrying over. And I mean, maybe the tricky part in defining this is getting someone to understand that no matter how many places there are, you have to keep applying the same rules. But it seems like even then, we could possibly explain that. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the, uh, it, it, look, on, on one, uh, in one sense, of course, you're, you're perfectly right that we do seem to manage to explain meaning by just a finite number, through just a finite number of examples. But the trouble here is coming when you say, but what, what, what's going on when you say now just carry on in the same way? Um, if, you, if you remember um, the add one example, yeah, um, I mean, which doesn't have this kind of breakdown, if you see what I mean. Well, maybe actually maybe it does have this kind of breakdown. Um, but the, the thing is, that kind of breakdown there clearly doesn't help because when, when you give us a finite number of examples and then you say, just keep doing the same thing. And then the deviant insists, I mean, this is what eccentrics always say, I'm just doing the same thing. I don't understand why other people <laughs> act so weird. Yeah? Um, I say, look, I am doing the same thing. I'm doing just what you showed me in these initial examples. That's right. They can still claim to be right. If That's right. If we previously shown in that example, there would be dependent. That's right. So it seems like we can, we can 
in a finite amount of time show someone how to add the number zero to nine. So that's there's finite information. That's right. If it's just zero to nine, that's right. If we can explain to them the carrying over rule, then we've just shown them a finite number of rules that allow them to generate all additions. You you've given a finite number of examples. Yeah. But it's when you say, and there's a strategy for generalizing those examples to the new cases, that's where there's nothing that makes you go one way rather than the other, because when you explain what the strategy is for generalizing to future cases, you're just using more signs, and those signs themselves have to be interpreted. And the only way of interpreting them is to look to see what someone does in particular cases. This is really basic, and we'll keep coming back to this. Yeah. One, two. Yeah. Okay, so I'm thinking about addition. So if you make addition like plus, if you add, if you add meaning to it. If you add meaning, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So is that a way to distinguish it, or is that something problematic in how you can't distinguish it? I don't really understand what you... Do, do, do this again. You said you can make addition like plus, like quest. Yeah. If you... That's right. Like, so if I add that meaning to addition? Yes. If you said I'm going to define addition in these terms. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So isn't that a way? Because you need to add, it needs to like add meaning, meaning to addition to make it like quest. So doesn't that show how they're different? Well, I, okay. When I set this up, I'm taking it for granted that we all know what we mean by addition and it's not quest. Yeah. Um, but that's really just for the sake of the example. It's like a ladder I'm now going to kick away because we t let's take for hypothesis that you mean addition and I mean quas. And then look, is there anything intrinsically different between us? And what I'm saying is take those systematic rules that the last question I was talking about, about what you do if you add one, right? You've got that going through your head. I've got that going through my head too. Yeah. And what we say about all the particular cases we've had so far that's just the same. So what is destabilizing here is what it comes to that you meant addition. Because there's nothing different between you meaning addition and you meaning quaddition. It actually turns out to be just the same thing when you look at the hard facts about what your mental states were. That's the argument. So you start out with this, these two different hypotheses, and then you realize there's actually no difference between them. They're assuming just the same things. Plus one. Um, I'm not sure if this actually poses a problem with Wittgenstein, but I just realized this. If we're trying to defer from finite to this one, uh -huh. instead of having a teacher and people, um, why don't we visualize the function in an objective manner, like creating a Turing machine, so that the student actually sees what the machine goes through when it adds a plus one? Right. And that way, for any x. Um, yeah. Right. It into the machine. Yeah. So that it's no longer a matter of my mind versus your mind or how we're interpreting something or the fact that it's coincidence, but it's actually out there in the world as like an objective fact. Okay. I agree it's a really good idea to think about machines in this context. Uh, 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 maybe train, even, even a machine that can learn, you can think about how you train it. Um, the thing is, uh, it, it depends exactly what machine you have in mind. Can it handle 27 digits? Um, can it handle a million digits? Can it handle a Google of digits? Yeah. Um, any machine that has its limitations. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're talking about an actual Turing machine with like tigers on the I don't know what an actual. Uh, you, you mean an, an actual? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You mean a physical thing that is realizing a Turing machine? You, you, you mean an actual yeah. concrete yeah. object? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, uh, it, 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 we'll actually come on to this kind of thing in just a second, yeah. Um, but the thing is, uh, I mean, not to uh, evade it, the thing is, um, suppose you took a sum that uh, it would take from now until the heat death of the universe to compute, right? The machine, what answer does the machine give to that? Is it, well, two questions, is there a right answer? 
Well, sure, there's a right answer. But it can't be that what makes it the right answer is that's what the machine would do. Because the machine wouldn't do it. The machine would have evaporated along with everything else. You will have an opportunity to come back to this. Yeah, it is more mileage. Yeah. Okay, but you see that this is a difficult conclusion to live with. I mean, I've been saying maybe the stuff we've been talking about about reference is just a mistake. I mean, <laughs> if this is right, then the whole class has been based on an even more profound mistake, namely, there's no such thing as meaning in the first place for us to study. Yes? But that is... Yes. <laughs> that is a bombshell. Okay. Um, well, there's an answer uh, uh, Kripke explores of, of, of some length that um, is actually connected to this thing about machines. He says, um, couldn't you appeal, suppose you, we accept that what's different between you and me when you mean addition and I mean quadition, there's no difference in which answers you actually did give in any past case, and there's no difference in what you had running through your head. But nonetheless, your dispositions were different. Even back then, before I ever dreamt of adding numbers as big as 57, if you had asked me what 57 plus 68 is, I would have said 125. That was always true of me. So even although I never did actually get up to those big numbers, it was always true of me that had you asked me, I would have given an, uh, the, uh, the, the, the addition rather than the quadition reply. I mean, that's true of all of us, right? We have endlessly many tendencies to act in lots of different ways. Um, so if you just take, is it clear what I mean by disposition? Just some of the threats and promises, some of the possibilities that we all have. Um, if you do this to me, I'll give you that as my reaction. So for lots of, I mean, just to take, uh, I mean, what, <laughs> You don't really see my, my full range of possibilities when you just think about uh, um, addition sums, but um, they're among the potentialities that you or I have, right, to answer lots and lots of addition sums. Um, so, so far, you, and indeed through your life, you only ever get to answer to deal with finitely many addition sums. But um, your potentialities, your dispositions to act, have always been there, and that gives you a way of expanding the talk about um, what might be fixing meaning beyond just what answers you actually did give and what general formulae you had running through your mind. Oops. So you could say, look, there's all these dispositions. What's 1 plus 1? What's 68 plus 57? Um, right, you right now, you all along, I've had all these dispositions, and you might say my dispositions are different to those of a quadder. Yeah, that's what makes me an, uh, someone using plus sign to mean add rather than to mean quad. But the trouble with this is that when you look at what your potentialities are, uh, what you will do to answer, what, what, what you really would, what answers you really would give, I mean, after all, you might have blind spots with some particular numbers. It might be that there are some numbers such that if you were to try to add them, um, your brain actually has a weak spot there, and that trying to add those particular numbers, you'd have an epileptic fit. Um, right? I mean, that could happen. Um, it could be that we'd have to add, some numbers might be so big that we'd have to add more stuff to your brain before you could cope with them. Yeah? Um, so th that's perfectly consistent intuitively with you meaning plus rather than quas. So if you run through, if we take you right now and we say, what answer would you give if we asked you four plus two? Well, you know, your friends gather around and they say, well, that's a safe bet. You could manage that. Six, nope, not a problem. Um, let's do something bigger, 68 plus 57. That wouldn't be a problem. But let's suppose um, we asked, well, what's 37,829,458 plus 4738291? Well, <laughs> you may, <laughs> with all due respect, <laughs> you just might not make it. 
Uh, um, your brain must might blow up in you at that point. The thing is, that seems perfectly consistent with you knowing perfectly well what addition is. Right? And what matters is not what answers you would give, but given your current understanding of the sign, what answers you ought to give. That's the basic problem, that given the meaning you currently assign to plus, there are right answers to these endlessly many, inf literally infinitely many questions of our addition sums. It doesn't matter if you're not perfect, if you would in fact give the wrong answers in many particular cases, because you're not very good at big sums, um, because uh, your brain gets tired, because, yeah, as people are, <laughs> I've got a mathematician friend and whenever he introduces himself to people, they say, oh, I was never any good with numbers. Um, you can be not very good with numbers, so you just give very bad answers once the questions get a little bit complex, but you still know perfectly well what add means, what plus means. So I hope it's kind of obvious that I think Kripke's interpretation here, the negative point that he's making, is really consistent with um, the kind of picture we were talking about the last couple of times, where uh, if you ask, what, what makes it the case that you and I, we could put it in Kripke's terms by saying, what makes it the case that you and I both mean the same thing by successor, by add one? Well, there are the examples you give, there are the examples I give, but the thing in the middle doesn't do any work. Because if we deviate at any point, we could both have that same thing running through our heads and our dispositions to give particular answers. I might be disposed to go off the tracks comp com compared to you um, around 100, but that might just show that I have a tendency to give the wrong answers once we get to around 100. There seems to be something about what we both mean by the sign that isn't being caught by what answers we'd be disposed to give, what we've got running through our head, or the answers we give in particular cases. But certainly the thing in the middle, that x plus one bit drops out as irrelevant. All we're left with is our tendency to give particular answers in particular cases. Okay? Okay, um, so let's just go back one, one more time over this thing about what the implications are of this picture for what you say about truth and reference. The intuitive picture we've been working with is, is that the meaning of a word is its contribution to the meanings of sentences, and the meaning of a word fixes what it is for a sentence containing it to be right or wrong. So if you take our old example, Sally is tall, you get two parts to that. Sally refers to Sally, and is tall applies to something, if that thing is tall. But in these terms, Wittgenstein's challenge is, what does it come to that you know that the predicate is tall applies to something just if it's tall? And what... What, what is it to be meaning one thing rather than another by the sign is tall? What do you have to appeal to? Well, you've got a string of words running through your head. You've got an image of somebody very tall. But you could interpret either of these in endlessly many ways. Any string of words you've got running through your head, the question is still, well, what do they mean? Or um, if you have an image of tallness, that, like the image of the um, elderly person going uphill with a stick or sliding gently downhill, um, any kind of image you have could be interpreted in many ways. So you don't have anything running through your head um, that constitutes you knowing this, that is tall, applies to something just if it's tall. This is really just like... How should I put it? It's a kind of really a shimmering fantasy, the idea that there's something like that 
in your mind. And Kripke's version of, uh, of this challenge is, how do you know that in the past you used the predicate is tall in such a way that it applies to someone if that person is tall? After all, maybe you meant stall, where um, stall applies to someone just if uh, it's before Monday, November the 5th, and they are tall, or is Monday, November the 5th, and they're three feet high. Right? There's nothing in your past use that means you, you, you mean one rather than the other of those. So if you're now confronted with someone and you're asked, um, are they stall? Sorry, <laughs> are they tall? I mean, you wouldn't know what you're talking about if I said are they stall. But if I said are they tall, and you looked back to your um, uh, previous understanding of the term, there wouldn't be anything in your previous understanding of the term that demanded that you had to give one answer rather than another. There isn't anything that makes it the case that is tall applies to something if it's tall. And similarly for the term Sally refers to Sally. All that we have, the only hard facts we have, are our verdicts as to the rightness or wrongness of particular statements. We do, in fact, agree in what we say about particular cases. It's lucky we do, because it's only because we do agree in particular cases that communication, civilization is possible. But we don't agree in those verdicts because we understand the term. Our agreeing in those verdicts is what constitutes there being such a thing as a meaningful term here. So nothing to guide, nothing to keep you and me together in saying this one's tall, that one's tall, that one over there is tall. Um, you say that, I say this one's tall, that one's tall, that one over there is tall. The image can't be what keeps us together, so the image drops out. And the string of words, is tall, applies to something. Just if it's tall, that drops out too. On that bombshell, um, Kripke tries to salvage the situation, and we'll look at Kripke's positive picture on Wednesday. Okay, thanks. Great questions. Thank you.